Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, and often in between, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. Today's episode is the next in our In Their Own Words oral history series, in which we talk with scientists who have made great contributions to their fields, particularly in the biological sciences. This week's guest is Marvel Lee Wake, a professor in the graduate school in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. She is also a past president of AIBS. Let's go to the interview. Dr. Wake, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for the invitation. It's a privilege and a pleasure. When did you first know that you wanted to work in the life sciences? <laughs> if, as I look back, uh, it seems I always did. Uh, my primary interest as a small child, aside from reading almost constantly, was um, being out in nature, observing, exploring, just generally looking around. And then by the time I was, oh, <clears throat> eight or nine, it became, like so many youngsters, uh, an interest in medicine. And uh, that grew ever stronger. But it now occurs to me that even as a teenager, I had the caveat that I wanted to do both the practice of medicine and some <clears throat> probably research in medicine. I wanted to know a great deal about how vertebrate organisms worked. And uh, that persisted. I went to college, uh, zoology major, basically uh, pre-med. But in my senior year, uh, I started shadowing a physician at a local very large hospital. And uh, though I was applying for admission to med school, and was admitted at three or four, I really became a, a little bit soured on medicine. Uh, at the same time, in my senior year, I was taking several of my zoology requirements. The professor of the evolution course called me in one evening and said, you should be doing a senior project. And to cut this story short, I've sort of been doing that senior project ever since. And uh, you know, just out of curiosity, um, what did you find less appealing about uh, medicine in particular? The fact that as I learn more about biology, it appears that even wonderful physicians were basically technicians. <clears throat> they didn't do their own testing. Uh, the kinds of applications of medicine were normalized and really didn't allow for variation which had long been, I know now, one of the things that really impressed me, and a number of things like that. Furthermore, it was highly organized, very little independence in it, uh, very little question asking. It was all sort of an acceptance of unknown authority, and that's not like me. <laughs> I could see how that would rankle. So going into um, you know a, a more traditional biology sort of track allows you greater independence, um, more ability to do open-ended research? Definitely, I think. Uh, I'm because of my interests in organismal biology and the environment, uh, that whole part of the uh, spectrum of biology was pretty wide open. And it uh, required what I now know to be a lot of integration of both approach and level of study. Uh, I noticed that many of my fellow students were really interested in the reductionistic aspects, pursuing ever and ever finer details about how things worked, uh, which is great. That's part of what I call integrative biology. But the key is putting the reductionism together with the broader scope of exploration of big questions about how things work. That's an interesting perspective. So it's a matter of not just capturing, you know, the the smallest elements, but then being able to reconstruct those into a larger whole. Yes. 
I think that's the way, uh, and it's an idea whose time has come. Uh, for about the last 20 odd years, uh, the emphasis has been bringing a greater range of expertise to large and complex questions. Uh, I had the uh, both honor and huge responsibility of being the organizing and then founding chair of our Department of Integrative Biology at Berkeley. And we were one of the first, uh, came online in 1989 with a lot of preparation before it. Uh, if I could add a slightly amusing story, uh, one of the uh, aspects of the reorganization of biology at Berkeley was the creation of a large department of molecular and cell biology and a smaller uh, department uh, that was more or less organismal ecological and evolutionary biology. And that's the one of which I was a part. When, as we were becoming organized, I learned that our colleagues in molecular and cell were calling us the Department of Leftover Biology. Uh, we had finalized our name as Integrative Biology. And I started writing papers on the conceptual basis for Integrative Biology. So uh, these kinds of discussions still press my buttons a little bit. I can imagine so. That's a that's a very cruel moniker that they apply. <laughs> it was not flattering. Let's put it that way. Um, we're, over time, um, were you successful in, in getting together with those folks and reaching uh, a broader understanding? Definitely. Uh, in the first place, there were individuals in molecular and cell biology who, of course, were somewhat reductionistic, but they were interested in the bigger, broader questions. For example, uh, how did genetics and uh, development impact the evolution of structure and functional relationships? So we had some good interactions going anyway. But I'm particularly pleased that as our Department of Integrative Biology has developed, we've gone back to uh, our zoological and botanical roots in a sense by having people who work on diverse organisms, but at all levels of study. And of course, as our biological science has changed, almost all of us, <clears throat> excuse me, are using uh, molecular and genetic techniques to answer questions of behavior, structure, function, development, uh, ecological interactions, you name it. So uh, it, it's worked quite nicely. And uh, you, as in your association with AIBS, have doubtless noticed that there are many departments and institutes and institutions of integrative biology now. It sounds almost as though yours would have been well ahead of its time, uh, because many of those techniques that you know sort of, in, in some sense, force that level of integration uh, were not yet developed in 1989. I think that is true, and uh, we hope that we helped it along. Uh, I have to point out, though, that many biological and physical scientists were uh, integrative biologists in the way they practiced their research. Uh, we just didn't use the label. We were uh, using multiple techniques to address uh, big and complex questions and pare them down and build them back up. Uh, so. It sort of worked. And when, for example, our brand new department went in uh, to try for one of the then new NSF graduate student training grants, uh, we had terrific reviews, but didn't get it the first time. Same the second time. Third time, NSF people told us to stop coming in. We were the model. We didn't need support. And we gasped. We had the idea. We didn't have the support for it. So we kept plugging along. Were they eventually uh, more helpful with funding and, and practical support? Uh, yes. And uh, 
NSF now has, of course, uh, several, at least two or three units that use integrative uh, in the titles of their programs and so forth, and grand challenges, uh, requests, and, and all sorts of things. They've been quite supportive. In fact, um, one of my later papers on integrative biology, I asked uh, one of the program directors at NSF if she would be willing to write a blurb uh, for publication in bioscience uh, about what integrative biology was, and she did. So NSF is represented in that paper very directly. Well, that's fascinating. Um, what would you say is the biggest surprise of your career? <laughs> well, I don't mean to sound egoistic, but when I look back, I think the biggest surprise to me is that I was have been able to mesh a respectable career in research, teaching, and a lot of service. Uh, I've had wonderfully uh, successive support from NSF, uh, and that's a lot harder to do now. So I worry about uh, the progress of the uh, integrative kinds of biology. Uh, I love teaching and worked hard at it, and service is something I strongly believe in. Uh, it's a way of giving back to the various uh, institutions and agencies that have supported my work, uh, which has allowed me to be a student all my life. Uh, and I've had the honor, privilege, and responsibility of uh, holding several presidencies of national and international societies, uh, which I've taken on only with the idea that we can pull even more uh, ideas and people in the biological sciences, sensulata, together if we make it an explicit uh, thing to pursue. And that is something that I have indeed pursued. And not alone by any means. And, you know, this may feed into our next question, which is about the differences between the way that science is conducted now and the way that it was when you first entered the field. <laughs> uh, but does that ability to do service, you know, is that a, is that a major shift, uh, you know, that you've noticed over the years? Has that, has that become harder for, uh, you know, newly minted graduates to do? I think the ability and the interest, consequently, in doing service has become much more difficult. Uh, it's more difficult by a lot now to conduct an academic career, certainly at a university, and I presume, well, I know, in, in a museum or uh, research agency to some degree uh, than it was when I started. The sheer paperwork the documentation necessary to receive funding, the follow-up, uh, the ongoing uh, paperwork responsibilities. Uh, <clears throat> while necessary and appropriate, I think could be streamlined uh, it has become ever more true, I think, that uh, any principal investigator who has his or her independent lab is in effect running a small business with personnel doing the ordering uh, on and on, as well as executing the research. And I don't think we do a very good job of uh, telling our uh, undergraduates and graduate students about that part of the picture. 
I know that my university and, and especially my own department try to help the youngsters. You know, both we have a graduate student survival course, and uh, these are all elements that we talk about in it, but what do they mean? And a number of other aspects uh, that have been instituted for good cause also pose a number of limitations, or they can. Uh, animal care and use regulations, uh, certainly important in many ways. But people in those units who don't know the animals sometimes make requirements that are not appropriate to those organisms. And because they're not in the book, you have to follow the book about something else. So there are still points of tension of that sort. At the same time, support units, even though money is tighter in many ways, are looking much more broadly at the kinds of problems that uh, should be funded. Uh, it's my experience that uh, the U.S.'s peer review system is one of the main things that keeps our uh, openness, our ability, our farsightedness underway. And that certainly makes sense. And, you know, to ask the unfair question, um, <laughs> you know, are, are there any things that's, that spring to mind or ways that, you know, the academy could potentially reduce that sort of administrative burden on scientists who are, you know, say, running an independent lab? Uh, that's a hard one. Uh, because of the crazy nature of some of my own research, I can't advocate templates for everything, although some I think are useful. Uh, having realistic rules and guidelines is another way. Uh, my university now requires a number of uh, uh, training programs that have to repeat it each year or every other year. Uh, I think the training is important, especially when methods change and, and ideas change. But I once uh, failed a training unit because I took it too fast. I didn't spend the required minimum of two hours uh, watching the video and answering the questions. I don't think any researcher needs that, and I don't think graduate students would be persuaded that it's a good idea either. That's just one example. That makes sense. It sounds like there are some opportunities out there to you know, separate the wheat from the chaff a little bit here and there. Yes. Let's shift gears and uh, talk a little bit about professional societies. Uh, what kind of role have they played in your career? Uh, as I said, I enjoy service partly because it's... Uh, a means of giving back and I learn so much more about how institutions work and the diversity that exists and all that. Uh, I meet a much greater diversity of colleagues and uh, new acquaintances. Uh, there are just so many things and then the ability of professional societies to advance the goals of their parts of science is something that I believe should be strongly supported. Uh, uh, I've been, let's say, at one point in my career, I was a member of about 20 professional societies. Uh, and I, <clears throat> I'm sort of hands-on, so moderately active to quite active in a number of them. But, uh, for example, 
I've been involved uh, in the leadership of both national and international societies. Uh, the American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists is one example, my first presidency. Uh, it's uh, a society that's a member of AIBS. And uh, we have long had a mission of explaining why amphibians and reptiles are uh, not only good uh, examples on which to do research, but of their importance in uh, ecosystems and all that, and why they're fascinating organisms. There are, there are several dimensions to each of these kinds of things. Uh, AIBS was a wonderful experience. The members of the board on which I served and, and then uh, chaired and so forth bring ideas, they bring scope, they bring vision, they bring experience. And that then becomes shared as uh, new uh, plans, new foci, the review of how things that we've already initiated or going, uh, can uh, be elaborated. Similarly, uh, one of my most exciting experiences with what I would call a society has been with the International Union of Biological Sciences. I've been involved with it since, oh, the early 1980s. And, uh, becoming its president was quite formidable. I'm still the only woman president they've ever had, and uh, we're a century old now. So there are still some changes that need to be made. But at any rate, that international body has had a hundred year mandate of, in essence, representing the biological sciences. In this hundred years, as you can well imagine, the changes in the practice of science, biology, have been enormous. And I'm uh, far too up on that because uh, I was asked by the IEBS Executive Committee about four years ago if I would consider writing a history of IEBS's first hundred years. And foolishly, I said yes, and fell into that fascinating trap. Uh, it resulted in a 255-page manuscript about which I gave a plenary lecture last July, and they plan to publish it as a book. So what I'm saying is these organizations grow. They provide leadership. Their influence waxes and wanes, and that's been interesting to watch too. What kind of leadership really works when you're trying to lead hundreds to millions of people who don't really know what you are? And I think that question pertains in some ways still to AIBS, and it certainly does to IUBS. This raises an interesting question since you've led several. What's it like in the early stages after you have been appointed to lead a professional society, what's the process of um, you know, stepping into that role like? What are the first steps? What are the things that you look for in setting you know, priorities and an agenda for um, you know, the term of your leadership? Well, first, uh, after my first couple of exp uh, experiences on a diversity of boards and committees and things like that, um, I decided that I shouldn't take them on unless I had some ideas about uh, things that either needed change or that with the framework already established could be enhanced to provide uh, new leadership or for the organization to provide new leadership and what it was trying to do and things like that. 
So uh, narrowing things uh, so that I felt I might have some competency was uh, a first and very important step. I'm also very good at imposter syndrome, wondering who am I? Why am I doing this? Uh, so part of it is trying to have some sense that uh, with the interaction of others, we might have a real role to play to make the particular society or uh, institution uh, better able to achieve its goals. Do you have a, um, thinking back, a most challenging day on the job that <laughs> you know particularly springs to mind was, um, you know, they can't, they can't all have been rosy. <laughs> well, uh, those, uh, I could cite two because they're sort of examples of the whole thing. Uh, one of them would be the day that I did decide to uh, accept the request to chair the uh, newly to be formed department of uh, all things not molecular and cellular at Berkeley. I'd been chairing the department of, Ber of uh, zoology, uh, so I suppose I was ripe for having my arm twisted. But when one is taking on the mission to bring together people who had been in uh, seven or eight different departments of some kind of biology on campus and to try to find what was best about all of them and to get them to really work together to pro promote a new entity was really a challenging chore. Did I have what it would need, given that you don't know what it needs? Um, it's challenging, but I took it on, had great people, many of whom objected to the reorganization at first because our departments of zoology and botany had just uh, been through one of these many uh, ACE evaluation things, the every 10 year ones, and had come out first and second in the nation. So there was a strong, we're not broke, why fix us attitude. Well, there were ways that uh, things needed to change. There were geneticists in seven or eight different departments. They had a tough time talking to each other. Uh, equipment was getting more and more expensive and needed to be shared. So there were lots of reasons to reorganize. And I put my foot in. How do you effectuate such a change? Um, is it simply, you know, pointing out the necessity and hammering it home at every, uh, you know, departmental meeting that's, that you hold? Is it a lot of personal correspondence with, you know, the various people who may not be as uh, well convinced of the necessity as, as, you know, you certainly would be? Um, is there, a, is there a standard operating procedure for that kind of operation to bring together a diverse group like that? Um, or do you just, you know, kind of play it by ear and, and go as you must? Well, there certainly is not a standard operating procedure. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with personal style of leadership anyway. But, uh, for example, the, uh, to use our Berkeley situation uh, to show the differences, uh, the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology started with a faculty of about, I think it was 72 faculty members from four or five uh, different uh, parental departments, if you will. With that size, they knew they had to have uh, sections. So those were set up. So they had a leadership structure. Uh, so th that was honed down. They knew they needed uh, a new building and things like that. And that was part of the uh, reorganization. So their leadership uh, 
well, this isn't entirely fair to them, but they had a more pragmatic role in setting up the, uh, the framework through which the department could function. Our Department of Integrative Biology um, first had lots of arguments about what the name of the department should be. But um, I and others liked integrative because it covered not just what we did do, but what we were thinking we hoped to do. But again, bringing all these people together uh, was difficult. Uh, our paleontologists became members of integrative biology. They had paleontology at Berkeley had been the last self-standing department of paleontology at a university in the United States. So losing it, my paleontological colleagues felt they were losing their identities or had that potential. Similarly, the uh, organismal, ecological, and evolutionary botanists who joined integrative biology because a department of plant biology was being created in the College of Natural Resources, felt they were losing their identity as plant scientists. So it was my role and that of the colleagues who backed me initially to try to bring this together. And uh, while one of the things that I learned was that it would have been much simpler if I'd been a dictator. That's not the way I can work. I, I believe in a lot of uh, interaction, collaboration, cohesion, and that takes a lot of work, but it's worth it. That's the way you can encourage people, you can find out what's bothering them, uh, you can find out what they think they're going to miss, and. and uh, try to fulfill it in various ways. And we're the only reorganized unit that uh, didn't move right into a brand new building and start running. Uh, we were in nine different buildings on and off campus while our life sciences building was totally renovated. And four years later, we moved in. But we had four years of that disjunction for me to try to put a department together. And the things that kept us going were the departmental seminar in integrative biology, the teas that we had before and sometimes after, and uh, searches for new faculty because we, to do that well, had to generate ideas about what we were and how we were going to practice science. And that, I think, is one of the main things that uh, gave us real impetus and the notion that we could succeed because we have the strength of the diversity that we brought to the science. So it sounds like a case in which, you know, philosophy and community um, are able to to triumph over some you know rather difficult disjunctions you know it, it, working separated you know uh, physically in different buildings and so on. I think so. These people all basically wanted it to work, and a critical thing that's part of that is their interest in good teaching, in the education, in the biological sciences. That's where some really good communication began very early and carries us through, I think, to this day. That makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what event uh, from your career uh, do you think will be best remembered long into the future? <laughs> By whom? <laughs> well, I don't think that I will be remembered for them or my role in them, but some of the things that I know I had some pretty good impetus in doing uh, might be uh, the way that the International Union of Biological Sciences developed its biodiversity program, biodiversity science program, 
which was really the, the first attempt to involve nations or the scientists in nations in broadly construed activities is real. And uh, a small body of nine of us basically put together what we call the Diversitas program. And uh, it had, you know, the normal institutional half-life of about 15 years and some controversy while it was going what it did. But uh, it, in essence, gave rise to the IPBES program that we have now, the uh, biology, uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services platform that has received a lot of attention for its uh, recent list of, uh, or recent data showing that uh, organisms are becoming extinct at a much greater rate than previous models had suggested. So these things lead, and I'm content with that. Hey, why not? Well, I mean, certainly it sounds like the work, you know, uh, persists extremely well. Well, lots of good people have been involved. They carry it forward, make the good changes. I'm not being selfless. It's just a fact. No, that, that makes sense. Um, what's the most frightening or intimidating thing that's happened to you in your professional career? Ooh, that's less pleasant to contemplate, of course. Uh, probably the kinds of treatment that uh, a woman being involved in leadership in biological science sometimes has to deal with. Uh, for example, uh, not so much intimidating, but why do I have to do this? Uh, when I was chairing the first time, there was a person in the uh, main administrative office who had a lot of influence on budget and things like that. And uh, I knew that in order to get uh, uh, information, uh, especially about some funding aspects and stuff, I'd have to uh, approach him and uh, negotiate and all that. Well, I would always would have to start with the kiss on the cheek and da 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 da. We won't go into that. We know where that stands. And I am so glad to see the world opening up in that regard. We still have a lot of work to do, but in the last five years, we co we've come a long way. So that is good. Similarly, uh, taking on the uh, presidency of the International Union, same kind of thing. Uh, lots of lies were told me about me, and that's no fun. But uh, you just keep working. My next question I wanted to ask about, um, and this you know may relate in some sense to being a, a woman, but just in general, in 1993, um, you were, uh, wrote an article for Bioscience on the two-career uh, couple, and uh, and it was part of an exchange. What? How has that experience been over the years? Uh, well, being a two-career couple has been mostly very good. My husband is doubtless my strongest supporter and my best critic. Uh, our uh, research is complementary, but uh, we're both independent and all that. Uh, it's given us uh, attitudes and uh, of course we were among the first at Berkeley to both be in the same department and uh, our then very good dean simply looked at us and said, don't have anything to do with each other's salaries. And we said, that's no problem and went from there. Uh, the attitude has changed enormously since I wrote that paper. I was critical of Berkeley for not having uh, good policies about uh, 
spousal situations and uh, things like that. That has changed, uh, not ideally, but uh, many more adjunct positions have become available. And I want to make the point that the so-called trailing spouse is not always female. Uh, in a recent case in my own department, and I hope they don't see this, uh, it was a search at an assistant professor level. A brilliant young woman was selected uh, whose husband was is uh, a very distinguished biologist in his own right. Fortunately, the department and then the university came through with an FTE for him, uh, this still isn't easy, but it was just the right thing to do. It enhanced the department in many ways, having both of them in the department with their independent research programs and uh, just all the things about the life of a scientist are just great. They have two tiny children, I think two and four years old now, and it's just wonderful to watch. And that's just one example. What are you working on right now? Ah, uh, well, I'm working on several things. Uh, trying to organize and complete uh, some research um, much of which I started some time ago, uh, so I have to be sure my data sets are uh, complete and valid for current analyses and dealing with current issues. Um, I'm an evolutionary morphologist with two primary interests. The One is the biology of uh, an order of amphibians that is not frogs and toads or salamanders and newts. The other is the evolution of derived modes of reproduction and the developmental and uh, uh, physiological biology involved in that evolution, all in a phylogenetic context. So that's one pod that I'm working on. Uh, I mentioned that I've just completed a history of or uh, perspective on the growth and development of IUBS in its first hundred years. And I've started writing a perspective on the reorganization at Berkeley and the development of the Department of Integrative Biology. <laughs> so I'm doing things like that. And I keep being asked to write uh, uh, sort of personal perspectives on careers, particularly for women, which I enjoy doing. Not that my own is special, but it exists. If you were entering graduate school today, is there anything that you'd do differently? Any other <laughs> subjects that you'd study? Any anything that you would you know seek out that you may not have the first time around, or uh, you know things that you would you know, perhaps leave by the wayside that you spent time on, um, you know, when you were originally studying? Uh, I would do almost everything differently. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention when I said I was on a med school track is that. Uh, I structured my undergraduate studies because I wanted, I thought, to do medicine. So that I spent most of my first three years uh, taking courses, in, of course the requirements, but courses in other areas of interest to me. And that turned out to be one of the wisest things I ever did. Uh, I had art history courses. I had several courses in English, uh, both literature and otherwise. Uh, I studied languages and just on and on. And then most of my, uh, as I indicated, my zoology requirements were in my junior and particularly my senior years. Well, that though, uh, 
had a major influence on uh, what I did next. I didn't decide not to go to medical school until I was virtually finished with my senior year and uh, working on that senior project with the person who became my major professor. He said, you ought to go to graduate school. I'm pretty sure I can get you a TA ship if you'll file for admission. So I did. And I've been doing that, as I said, ever since. So I did not have the normal uh, coursework track, nor certainly the careful thinking about choosing a graduate program that I would advise anyone to do now. I think you have to assess your abilities and interests, uh, know as much as possible about the fields that interest you, if possible, go to uh, meetings of the professional societies that are represented uh, among your interests, at which and those societies are much more receptive to undergrads being present. Do some undergraduate research, of course. Um, so yes, I do a lot, quite a bit differently. And I, I think you've mostly just answered my last question, but do you have any other advice that you would share with uh, young or aspirant scientists? Uh, yes, I think the main thing is to be open-minded, be questing, be curious. Don't decide too soon that you need to narrow your goals. Keep in mind that you have to broaden them. Science is changing so rapidly that the acquisition of new techniques, new ideas, new ways of doing things is really important. So reach out, talk to people, even if you're shy. And frankly, I'm pretty shy. It's important to be present, be ask questions, look around you. And that's excellent advice, and I think a great note on which to leave the conversation. Dr. Wake, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences, and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you, and talk to you next time.